A recent survey by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business warned it was likely that more than 180,000 small businesses across the country would not make it through this pandemic. And for Ontario, they said that could mean somewhere on the order of 20% of such enterprises. With us now for more, in Kingston, Ontario, Becky Ryber. She's a professor of strategic management at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. In the junction in the capital city, Langton Willems, the owner of Gerhard, a men's clothing shop that specializes in made in Canada only menswear. And John Kiru is here. He's executive director of the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas. And we're glad to have all three of you on this program tonight for, um, well, let's face it, this is a dire conversation about a very serious set of circumstances. Let's put up some of these numbers from the CFIB and just share with our viewers and listeners uh, the nature of what you folks are looking at right now. This was released last week, the 21st of January, and here are the results. 37%, more than a third of small businesses are fully open in the province of Ontario, but compare that to British Columbia, where 64% of businesses are fully open. 75,000 businesses, 75,000 are at risk of shuttering for good in the province of Ontario. 2.4 million jobs are at risk in Canada, which translates to about 20% of private sector jobs that are at risk in this country. I just need to start with some general reaction to all of that. Langton, come on in here. You hear those numbers. What do you think? I mean, it sounds right. The junction is completely papered up right now. Um, a lot of the businesses have gone under. Uh, I can see that commercial rental rates have kind of plummeted, which I suppose is a good thing in and of itself. Um, but the, but honestly, the the street, this, especially during the lockdowns, the street is just dead. The streetscape looks hollowed out. Um, yeah, no, the, the numbers make sense to me. John, how about you? You hear those numbers and you think what? Uh, they're only going to get amplified as we go deeper into this thing. They are reflective of what I am hearing out there uh, as well. Um, and to have been shut down through the most prosperous, if you will, or, you know, make hay while the weather's good, the pre-Christmas season is going to put more of those businesses in peril. January, February, March are traditionally uh, the challenging times for business, and that's when we see some closures. But this has only amplified that. So those numbers are quite reflective of what I'm hearing. Becky Ryber, your initial reaction. Yeah, I, I agree, too. I think the numbers are heartbreaking for, for business owners. And uh, I think they're good, though, to um, to have out there to, for, to draw attention to people um, so that if they want, you know, every, everybody wants their small business uh, sector or the retail sector in their neighborhood to succeed. And so drawing attention to that, because there are ways that people can, can help um, that. But the numbers are devastating. Langton, just checking. You're in your place right now, right? You're in your store? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As and you can see, we're closed. Well, yeah. I mean, it's too early anyway, but the gate the gate stays closed all day. I was going to say, you're, you're shut tight as a drum right now. Is that right? Yes. Nobody's allowed in. How are you managing to stay afloat? Um, initially, I felt bad saying this. Uh, we're, we're doing great. Like, the, the, the year... The year has actually, like 2020 was, was good for us. We quickly pivoted to online. Um, we were already about 40% online before the pandemic struck. Now we're 100%. It was a little bit of a scramble getting set up right at first, but we, we've settled into it quite comfortably. Um, I, I was discussing with Leanne earlier, though, uh, the main challenges right now with I mean, I mean, it's great. I feel I feel very fortunate to to uh, have have been able to pivot so quickly to a, to a digital um, business model. Um, Let me follow up on that, that if I can, Langton, and and just yeah. the Leanne you referred to is Leanne Kotler, who's producing this item. You had a pre-interview with her. That's who you're referring yeah. to, I presume. Uh, I, this is one thing I don't get. You're in the clothing business. People yes. need. To, I would have thought. People need to try the stuff on. They need to look at themselves in a mirror. They need to see if it works for them. How do you do all of that online? Yes. So one of the challenges is we've, we've, when you pivot to an online business model, you no longer compete. Okay, so we sell made in Canada clothing. So that, that's very important to me. It's very important to my clientele. My clients appreciate that, and they appreciate the sort of the, the neighborhood community feel that the shop offers. When you go online, though, it's a completely different clientele. 
So people in the neighborhood value uh, what we're trying to do uh, from a sort of social, environmental, economic perspective. Online, I'm not saying I don't have online customers who don't do this, but our international clientele is more interested in the brands that we have uh, because of their they're cool, for lack of better words. So they don't really care that the product is made in Canada. Some do, most don't. Uh, but for you know, for example, they'll buy the brand because it has some international cachet. We selected our brands with that criteria in mind. Made in Canada, but carry some weight internationally. So I'm serving a different audience right now. At, we can get into this later if your if your time permits. But at a serious loss to my margins. Hmm. Okay, John. That that that's an example of one particular business. Maybe you could give us the broader picture right now. How easily or with how much difficulty have the businesses that you represent? This is the word of 2021. Pivoted to uh, to try to stay afloat. Yeah, uh, and and going digital has been uh, been the way to go. Uh, we even pre-COVID realized the Amazons and the consumer habits that were happening out there. We've developed uh, Digital Main Street, uh, which is a tool with the assistance of the City of Toronto and both the federal and provincial government. We've been able to implement this out across the business community, the small business community, for an opportunity for them uh, to start up a store with, when they might not have thought of it, providing them with the tools and the assistance uh, to, to pivot to that. And many have. We've had thousands of businesses do that. Some do it better than others, uh, but there is that opportunity, and that seems to be the, uh, the area of those businesses that are surviving that have pivoted uh, because depending on, on just phone calls or, you know, people knocking on the door and trying to pick up something is, is uh, not enough to keep people in business. So pivoting to online has by far uh, been the most effective way of trying to help businesses stay in business. And Digital Main Street, quite frankly, is the tool that we've put out there and we have helped a significant number of businesses across the province. Okay, to that end, Professor Rybert, uh, clearly not everybody is doing badly during this pandemic. There are some businesses that are figuring it out and there are some businesses that are doing pretty well. Are the, maybe you could let us in on some of that. Would, which would be the success stories in an economy the likes of which we're living through right now? Well, I think um, just um, the, the ones that succeed are the ones that are inventive and the ones that can think of ways to take what they have and be able to pivot to something else. For example, you know, another example of a, of a service business is, is an escape room. I don't know whether you've ever played an escape room, but it's, um, it's, you go into, it's, it's a commercial business. You go into a room, you solve some puzzles and you try to escape in an hour. Well, there couldn't be a worse business under COVID because, you know, a whole bunch of unrelated people are trapped in a room together. Um, but there's business, but there's escape rooms in Toronto that now have pivoted online. And so they put an employee in the room with a camera and friends and family that are playing the escape room are, are on Zoom watching this. So it's essentially the same game, but you're doing it remotely. And, um, you know, like, like the clothing retailer, they are able to now to sell to foreign markets. It's, it's, it's interesting because in their pivot, they've also been able to expand their business beyond Canada because nothing's more physical of course, than an escape room. But, you know, I knew someone in Boston that was playing it. Okay, that can't be as much fun as the real thing, but at least it's something, I guess, eh? Something, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. It's okay. also not nearly as profitable. Not nearly no. as profitable? Well, what happened with, it's like with restaurants, right? Like switching to a takeout model, and everyone was uh, congratulating uh, the government on allowing restaurants to continue uh, serving alcohol with takeout going into the future. But it's a, you know, it's a sorry excuse. It's a sorry substitution for what they've lost. It's in the same way with our business. Like, it, you know, it's it's wonderful that we we've been able to keep our uh, our revenues actually up on 2019 throughout 2020. But revenue and profit are two very different things. So, e-commerce e is an interesting model. The only people who win at e-commerce are people who can do it at scale. Um, it, it, my shipping costs are are outrageous. The rates that I pay credit card processing companies go up when I do things online remotely because then uh, a fraud surcharge is added to it. Um, my, my costs are through the roof. Like my, my revenue 
sure, it was up on 2019, but it, you know, 2020 wasn't profitable. Langton, while you've got the floor, let me ask you about another aspect of your business, because I gather one of your big calling cards was that all of your stuff is made in Canada. What, mm -hmm. Where is that at right now in terms of that being a big selling point? So what, in terms of it being a big selling point, well, I mean, in, in addition to it being a, a big selling point, I just think it's good for society, it's good for people, it's good for the environment. I, I, I started with that eight years ago when I started this business um, and, and, have, and have stuck firm to it. Eight years ago, it was a lot easier than it is now, eight years into the future, made in, made in Canada. Making things in Canada has kind of, it's been on decline for a long time. And I've noticed it very sharply. Many of the factories that we deal with over the past eight years have had uh, constraints, problems, or have even gone out of business. Many have gone out of business. Now, the lockdowns have accelerated a process that was already happening. So everything, everything manufacturing is all moving to uh, sort of developing economies. Um, which is, which is fine. Like, you know, it, 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 it's fine. You, you can make a great jacket in China. Uh, but the, but it, it, it is kind of hollowing out, hollowing out our own, our own local economy. Um, I'll, I'll use an example of one jacket maker we ordered from. So we pre-booked eight styles from a Canadian jacket maker who makes the majority of their products in China, but we always select the Canadian jackets. So mid-season, as a result of the lockdowns, uh, the production that was slotted to take place in Canada actually moved to China mid-production, uh, and um, uh, and and um, I, I don't see it coming back next year either. Like I've just seen the forecasts uh, for next year; they're they're not they're not making nearly as much in Canada, and. Um, uh, and, and that's because China didn't have to go into lockdown. It did, but it was very, it was very quick. And, well, let me pick up on that. Of course. Yeah, John, I want to pick up on that issue of lockdown because in the stats we gave off the top, it looks like British Columbia has almost, and this is under an NDP government, they have almost twice as many small businesses fully open right now as does the province of Ontario. So let me get your judgment on how fair you think in Ontario the current lockdown protocols are right now. Yeah, and, and you know it's it's difficult to go against public health and the uh, and those interests. So you know people are dying out there, and we're in support of you know what needs to be done needs to be done. But we're not understanding the science behind some of the decisions, which leads to only 37 percent of the businesses being open. Uh, we truly believe the small business is as capable, if not more capable, in controlling their own little environment and doing, uh, you know, modifying the lockdown while maintaining protocols and appointments. Uh, you know, we can take one or two people into our stores, make sure the things are cleaned, et cetera. So no. the lack of science, lack of clarity on how these decisions were made is only compounded by the fact that as, as uh, you know, we're hearing more and more charges being laid out into the big places that are out there, uh, the power centers, et cetera. So clearly they haven't got the grasp of it. So it's it's that lack of understanding of what the rationale behind that is. Nobody's ever come out and said, look, you guys are, are more susceptible to this or people going from store to store uh, may cause this, et cetera. We haven't heard that science. You know, it's very difficult for a small a small business person to see somebody walking out of a Walmart with a 90-inch TV and a bag of non-essential goods and to justify of why they can't at least sell a sweater or a toy uh, that that is readily available in these places. So that's that's the one question that I continue to hear. Why? I can do better. I can control who comes in. I can't. Where is the science? Please explain the science to us, is the continuous outcry that I hear out there. Yeah, Professor Ryber, we've heard numerous, uh, and, and I guess given voice to numerous complaints on this program over the last many months of people who do not see the logic in allowing consumers to absolutely pack Walmarts and buy whatever they want at Walmart stores, while on the other hand, shutting down all small businesses who really can uh, control the flow of people into their places. You know, you... But, before the state of emergency, you'd see people lined up outdoors and just waiting until there were fewer people inside to come in. Why, why do you suppose uh, the government is taking the position it is, which is it's okay for the big boxes to be open, but the small retailers have to be closed 
This is, after all, a progressive conservative government. The premier is himself a small business operator. Why do you think they've gone this way? I don't know. I don't know, but I do think that they need to explain it because I think that a lot of people are are upset about it, and it's not just the business owners. It's it's also their um, their customers who want to to see them succeed. So there's there's that anomaly. There's the anomaly of the big box stores being open and the and the small retailers on Main Street not being open. It's also the bakery. The florist next to the bakery is closed. When the bakery is open, they're both the same size. They both probably have similar ventilation systems. They both, you know, they're, they're just, it would just be nice to hear some logic behind, um, you know, why some of these decisions were made. Langton, how do you think it could be made fairer? Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, I asked the question because I presume as a small business I, person, I just, you think I you could be I, open and operating safely. Yes, yes, 100%. And you know what was really crazy was the when they did the first lockdown and they gave me pages and pages and pages of legalese to sift through and figure out what I needed to do with my business now to avoid uh, fines and imprisonment. And some of the rules just seemed, they seemed designed by someone who had actually never set foot in a small business. One of the things that I found the craziest rule of all of them was it said, it said, Take the amount of square meters that you have on your floor space and divide that by four. In theory, that should allow everyone to stand two meters apart. So I did the calculation and I was just like, wait, you mean I'm allowed to let 16 people into my store? I've never had 16 people in my store. <laughs> so all sorts of, you know, I usually have people in one or two at a time. And all of these sort of things were just like, really? So I need to close, but you're comfortable with a larger store operating with people so long as they're able to stand? You know, you can put a lot of people in a room and have them stand two meters away from each other. Uh, I, I'm just, I mean, that, that's some great math there. Do, do, you, um, do you know who your member of the legislature is? And have you made contact with that MPP to talk about the anomalies you just pointed out? No, I was slammed. Honestly, the, when all of these rules came out, I skimmed them, did my best to understand some of the things. A lot of the wording was contradictory. I couldn't tell what were laws and what were recommendations. Um, I, I can't afford a lawyer to go through this stuff for me. It was the same with, maybe I'm going off topic, but it was the same with stimulus as well. I didn't get any stimulus. Like maybe I qualified for some of it, but it was just like, I couldn't understand. Like I, I didn't have time to sift through all of this, this paperwork. Well, surely you would have been eligible for a rent subsidy. And if you have any employees, you, they would have been able no, eligible for CERB. No, CECRA I couldn't get because my, uh, my, like I said, my revenue didn't decline. Uh, my revenue was up, but my profits are down again because we've switched to an Amazon model instead of a small neighborhood business model. So all of my profit is actually getting eaten up by large fintech corporations and, uh, and, and delivery services. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't. I, I got I got SIBO, which was nice, um, but I haven't been able to qualify for the um, the Ontario grant. I didn't qualify for CECRA. I didn't qualify for CEWS because all of those are linked to a decline in revenue. Gotcha. No, which which I believe should be profit, but it's hard to it's hard to prove. Understood, John. Uh, don't misunderstand this question. I'm not suggesting a January sixth uh, storming of Queens Park. Uh, apropos of Capitol Hill in the United States. But I do wonder if at some point you have had it pass through your mind that um, you need to take a bunch of people, maybe thousands of small business owners, down to the South Lawn of the legislature and uh, make a fuss. What about it? Well, you know, we, we, we did that around taxes in 1998 when current value assessment came in and uh, businesses in small communities in Toronto were facing 700% tax increases. This one, uh, this one is a little more difficult than that. Uh, you're, you know, uh, doing a protest out there, it just becomes clear that, first of all, you might just get charged because you're getting more than five people together to, out there, and, and we can't afford to pay out any more than we already have been. But uh, there has been talk. Steve, I'll, you know, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that some business are simply circumventing uh, what's out there right now customer calls that they need something and says, come on down at six or seven o'clock in the night. They let them into the store, etc. So people are fed up. 
their livelihoods, their life investments, their families are at stake here, and they will do what it takes, whether it's a, it's a march on Queen's Park or, or elsewhere. Uh, it's not in the cards right at the moment, uh, that's for sure. All we're trying to do is, through opportunities like this, to have our voice heard out there and uh, to justify to us why the biggest employers in this country, small business employees, over 90%, of, of people out there, uh, why we would be the ones that would be shut down. You know, for every dollar spent on Main Street, 67 uh, cents of that stays local. Uh, you know, uh, it, that's certainly not the case from the big power centers where up, up to and over 43 cents out of every dollar spent on Walmart ends up in Arkansas. So if we're talking about building the Ontario economy and, and you know, uh, supporting Canadian and doing all that sort of stuff, we've got to you know, not talk to talk, but also walk to walk. And certainly not allowing people to walk into a small business uh, is have an impact on those. And those numbers will show. We will continue to lose small businesses. And with that, our communities, because it's a known fact how Main Street goes, how our commercial streets go, so goes the rest of the neighborhood. And, and that spillover is happening out there. You know, Ronson's Vales mm -hmm. showed you what it could look like with the boarded up windows and pushing this sort of thing out there. So right now, it looks like the numbers are going down. We'd love some predictability of what we can look forward to in terms of if we have less than a thousand cases in Ontario for five consecutive days, that there may, might be a modification, et cetera. We're just simply sitting here and not able to fulfill what many entrepreneurs have invested their life savings into. And without predictability, without understanding and the rationale, um, yeah, maybe that maybe that march might happen. Hmm. Well, Be Becky Ryber, maybe you could help us understand, building on what John just said, if, if half the restaurants in, let's say, Main Street, Ontario, go under, uh, if one out of every three retailers is not going to be here by the end of the year, can you paint us a picture of what you imagine this province and the main streets of this province are going to look like by the time this is all said and done? Well, I think it's going to be very different. I mean, people people see it now. I think it'll be it'll be tragic, and and people will hesitate to maybe may hesitate to start a business. I think when when you look at those numbers, we look at the one third that is um, still in business, and we and we sort of feel sorry for the two thirds that aren't, which is which is fair. But as Langdon had said, the one third that are still in business really aren't aren't doing that well. There's there's financial issues. There's um, there's just the workload of, of of running the business, of pivoting, of trying to figure out what to do. And I think um, you know John talked about predictability, and that's just not going to come. Uh, I was talking to to someone uh, when I was shopping before Christmas, and she'd had to put her her Christmas order in last March when we just got into our first lockdown. So you can imagine um, the uncertainty of her knowing what people would be buying in her store nine months later with, during a pandemic. It's similar, business owners are making decisions now, investment decisions, merchandising decisions for things that will happen nine months from now, and nobody can tell them what the environment is, is going to look like. And so... It's just a very diff difficult situation for them, and I think you know I don't think there will be predictability in the in the in the short term anyway. Becky, as you analyze what's going on right now, can you think of a more existential threat to business, generally speaking, small business in particular? I don't know. In the last hundred years, do you have to go back to the Great Depression to find anything this ex existential to their survival? Nothing, nothing in my career for sure. I mean, there was the dot com boom and the dot com bust, but that was just, uh, you know, that was just one sector, and and it and it recovered. But but really, nothing like this. Hmm. Langton, what do we need to see to give you guys a shot? Uh, I mean, I I just like to know when the lockdown's going to be over. Um, uh, it, it, I don't know if it's a selfish ask, but maybe some stimulus programs that are linked to a loss of profit rather than a loss of revenue. Um, uh, and, and I think a lot of the things that we need to see the future of a um, uh, small business success, it already exists. Uh, the outpouring of support that I got from the community 
during the first lockdown was it it it, it was it was an emotional experience like i i had people um i never once prompted people to do this or asked for it by email or social or anything like that but people were just buying pouring in buying gift cards uh, they didn't want anything now, but they wanted to make sure that my cash flow was protected so that they could buy things next year, which they knew they would. That's wonderful. Uh, you don't have to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. We heard John say earlier that uh, some retailers are just wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Come on down here at 8 o'clock at night. I'll open up the store and you can get something. Have you had to do that? Um, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A word to the wise is sufficient. I got it. Yeah. Uh, John, in your judgment, what's it going to take to get this sector back on its feet? Look, entrepreneurs are creative, energetic individuals, and we will bounce back from this. Main Street might not be the way you remember it. There will definitely be shifts. I think that crisis spending is over. Uh, I, you know, continue the program still well out of it. But I sure as heck hope that the governments have kept some powder dry for the recovery spending that's going to be needed to save our small businesses that are in business, to assist those that are going to come into business in this environment, and to help rebuild the communities because we're an ecosystem. You know, Toronto might be a large, large uh, metropolis, basically, but the bottom line is that it's made up of neighborhoods and communities that are served by their small businesses. So there needs to be a focus on recovery spending. What, how can we stimulate small businesses to reinvest, to buy local, to if essentially order goods to be ready for that opening? So uh, as I've said, crisis spending is over. We don't want to see it finished but continue it certainly till the point when we start opening up and people even a little beyond that to give them that foundation. But really it is recovery funding. And what are we gonna do to help these people recover? Becky, I've got a minute to go here and I need to ask you about this. Uh, just the other day, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives brought out quite an exhaustive study in which they said provinces across this country are literally sitting on billions upon billions of dollars in their bank accounts. They're I don't know what they're waiting for. They're waiting for something to spend it on. What do you think about the fact that that money's sitting there while small business is suffering so badly? Um, I'm not going to wait into a I, I don't. I don't know about that number. Sorry, I just... Um... It seems it seems a shame. It seems that there are, is something that could do. I think, you know, in defense of the policymakers, they're fighting a lot of fires right now on a, on a lot of different fronts, and uh, it, that certainly makes sense. But I guess to weigh in on it, I'd have to know a little bit more. Sorry. No, th that's actually allowed. We allow people on this program, if they don't know, to say, you know what, I don't know. In fact, I like that. Uh, that's <laughs> Becky Ryber from the uh, Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. John Kiru, who's with the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas. Langton Willems. Gerhardt, if you're in the west end of Toronto at the junction, just knock on his door at 8 o'clock at night. He might let you in and buy a jacket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that, Langton. Thanks to the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight. We really appreciate hearing your views. Thank you. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.